I welcome you all back to the Ideas Forum 4 on Climate Action from G20 to COP28. There is a profound connection between climate action and the burgeoning paradigm of life economy, a connection that underscores the inextricable link between human well-being, economic progress and environmental sustainability. As we chart our course towards a life economy, it is important to recognize the pivotal role that climate action plays in shaping the contours of this transformative paradigm. As India completes its G20 presidency and the global community enters the COP28 process in Dubai, the questions of inclusive development, energy security, addressing climate change and sustainable development assume importance. Developed countries have, under the UNFCCC, agreed to take a lead in combating climate change, provide new and additional climate-specific finance, and transfer technology to developing countries for tackling the climate crisis. Adaptation is an overwhelming concern and overriding priority for developing countries. In this context, Fostering international cooperation through multilateralism to encourage sustainable lifestyles and accelerate growth of the life economy is very essential. So to moderate this session, we have with us Dr. J.R. Bhatt, formerly scientist at the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and presently adjunct professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. Sir, the floor is all yours. You can begin with the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. G20 to COP28. That is the theme of this session that all of you have been waiting for. And let me not take any time of the panelists. Let me straight away come to our first and the keynote speaker, Dr. Anurabha Ghosh, who is the CEO of CEEW and uh, all of you know our, uh, our dear and respected Dr. Anurabha Ghosh, but just to say a word about him, he is an internationally recognized public policy expert, author, columnist, institution builder and he has taken the CEW to new greater heights. I would request Dr. Anurabha Ghosh to give his keynote address, contextualizing the journey not only of India but of the world now from G20 to COP28. Over to you, sir. Uh, this is not my presentation. Good. This is Professor Srikant's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, as always, it's always a pleasure to engage on discussions related to climate with you. 
But of course, you've pulled together a very eminent panel, and I'm very grateful to RIS for inviting me. Um, three days before our G20 presidency formally closes, and three days before the COP28 negotiations formally begin. Um, if there were a bridge to be built, this is the time. So thank you so much for having this discussion. Um, what I'll try to do here is, in my presentation in just framing uh, the issues that will come up is look at this issue of not just climate action, but more broadly how India's G20 presidency framed the issue of climate within the context of sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles. And I'll draw attention to both the priorities as well as the outcomes that were achieved. And then I will map that to what are the priorities that are already listed for COP28 by the uh, COP28 presidency, and therefore where we might all collectively work together for some concrete outcomes so that two weeks from now we can say that we made some progress. I represent the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. It is an independent think tank, but we were very privileged to support the government of India during its presidency uh, through, its, through our work across several different working groups. But at CEW, we focus not just on transformations in our low carbon economy or in our power system or in our industry, but also on the quality of life issues, what matters to the ordinary citizen, uh, whether it is the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, how we move, how we cool ourselves. This is what matters ultimately for the people on whose behalf we claim to speak. In order to make any of that happen, of course, we need the enablers of finance and technology, but we also need to become a lot more efficient with our resources and hence drive a circular economy. Some of these themes will now come through in what I mentioned. Let's start with a slide I presented um, almost exactly a year ago in December of last year, at the beginning of India's G20 presidency, when the first development working group meeting happened of the G20. The idea was, what does sustainable lifestyles mean when it comes to broader development policy? And uh, very crudely, I don't know how many of you are economists. I was a very so-so economist, but I'll still put it across. Um, the normal GDP calculation is based on calculating consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus net, net exports. That's the top part. Now, when we talk about lifestyles, it's not just switching off a light or turning off the tap it is actually how does that translate into what it means for a gross domestic product. And therefore, when you start looking at sustainable consumption from a lifestyle perspective, or investment to drive sustainable lifestyles, or government expenditure that could drive it, or net exports, you end up with a GDP that is more sustainable. That's the um, small s there. Now, what could that mean? Uh, it could mean moving from private transport to public transport. The buses there, India is promoting the world's largest procurement of e-buses or aims to have the world's first large railway system that will be net zero. It could also mean investment in energy access, as we did over the last few years, but energy access to drive livelihoods becomes a very different paradigm. The top picture up there shows you solar-powered silk reeling that, uh, or the bottom right, solar-powered food drying. We estimate that distributed renewables alone could drive livelihoods worth $50 billion in India's rural economy. So these are examples of how sustainability and sustainable lifestyle choices, whether it's in the food we consume, the focus on natural farming uh, that India is promoting, or in in sustainable agriculture using solar irrigation, the consumption, the investment, the government procurement, and the net exports can drive sustainable GDP as well. Um, so then let's switch to what was India's priority or what were India's priorities as we began the G20 presidency. 
And I will focus on the sustainability priorities. Of course, there were others with regards to, for instance, the digital economy and so forth. I'll, I will not address that issue. First was raising trillions for the billions of people in the global south. And this meant not just the quantum, but the manner in which the money was delivered by reducing the risks of the investment, but also looking at the macroeconomic impacts of climate change and the transition pathways, as well as the low-cost financing of the energy transition. There was also a very explicit focus on lifestyles for the environment um, and a push for high-level principles, um, as well as a push towards circular economy and circular bioeconomy, as well as extended producer responsibility. India also ensured that climate action was not the only SDG that was within our, within our scope of priorities. We wanted an action agenda for 2030 that focused on broadly accelerating the sustainable development goals, including using digital transformations and women-led development. And finally, there was a focus on what was called the fuels for the future. How do we move towards a sustainable economy without looking at the technology gaps in intellectual property and new technologies in the energy, whether it's green hydrogen, supply chains for renewables, critical minerals, biofuels, these were all put on the agenda. Now, the way this was organized, um, sorry if some of this sounds technical or boring, but it is important to understand that even the motto of one earth, one world, one future was not an empty motto. It had a, an element of concrete uh, action items as well as deliverables. So when we looked at One Earth, in the Environment Climate Sustainability Working Group, there was a lot of focus around biodiversity, land degradation and ecosystem restoration, around circular economy, around extended producer res responsibility, around the blue economy. But equally, this was not just in the Environment Working Group. In the Development Working Group, the focus came in on lifestyles. But one family, how, what do we do together? And this is where bridging not just the environmental dimensions, but the economic and technological dimensions became important, which is why the Energy Transition Working Group, the ETWG, focused on those fuels of the future, on low-cost financing of the energy transition. Equally on the finance track, the Framework Working Group focused on the macroeconomic consequences for food and energy insecurity and climate change. The Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group was introduced for the first time for building disaster resilient infrastructure. And again, the Environment Climate Sustainability Working Group also tried to work with industry on pushing for circular economy. And what did all that um, lead up to, or what was it meant to lead up to? A renewed multilateralism, as the de Development Working Group ensured through the accelerated progress on SDGs, the Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group focusing on early warning systems, and the Sustainable Finance Working Group on looking at mobilizing climate finance. All of this then came together in terms of an outcome. I began with GDP, then I talked about sustainable GDP, and now I'm going to give you another GDP. And that's the real outcome from our G20 presidency, the Green Development Pact, not gross domestic product. The green was focused on sustainability. Development was to align this move towards sustainability at the planetary level with people-centric growth. And the pact was really a covenant of the coming together of the global north and the global south, not just through the inclusion, for instance, formally of the African Union, but also the voice of the global south conference that India held way back in January uh, to articulate the views of the countries that were not at the table. So I will quickly illustrate for you some of those clear outcomes. There was a clear action plan to accelerate progress on SDGs, recommitting to them, including not just the climate ones, but also many other SDGs. But from the Environment Climate Sustainability Working Group, we see numerous other concrete outcomes. High-level principles on lifestyles for sustainable development, a disaster risk reduction working group, a G20 global land initiative to reduce land degradation, it, the principles for sustainable and resilient blue and ocean-based economy, a program for marine litter action, and an industry coalition for resource efficiency and circular economy. 
Equally on the development side, there was a lot of focus on the energy fuels of the future that will drive the development. And hence, a focus on 3x increase in renewable energy capacity, 2x increase in energy efficiency by 2030, the launch of a new global biofuels alliance, a focus on the nuts and bolts in the supply chains for critical minerals and semiconductors, ensuring that the rules for green hydrogen were drafted in a proper manner, and therefore the voluntary principles on hydrogen, as well as the voluntary high-level principles on collaborating on critical minerals. And finally, we have the pact. And the pact is really about money. Um, so the climate finance outcomes that we saw out of coming out of the G20 was putting the large trillions number out there very explicitly, $5.9 trillion needed by developing countries to implement the nationally de determined contributions, the $4 trillion needed for clean energy technologies, but also the call, and this is the call to the COP process, the new collective quantified goal uh, for climate finance, doubling the adaptation finance, replenishment of the Green Climate Fund, and so forth. So as I close my presentation then, I talked about the three days that we have for the bridge between our presidency and the UAE presidency of the COP. So first, in order to build a bridge, you've got to see what is on the other side of the river. And on the other side of the river, we see that the UAE COP puts out four action plan pillars. Again, similar to our presidency on transforming climate finance, a just, orderly, and equitable energy transition, a focus on nature, people, lives, and livelihoods. Remember, our presidency also focused not just on climate, but on biodiversity, not just on the broader energy transition, but bringing it closer to people, and underpinning everything, as they claim, with full inclusivity. So I believe, and this is based on CEW's analysis of, uh, excuse me, of all the country submissions that have been put forward for the global stock take, we see four aspects that are coming through from these country submissions. Account for the pre-2020 gaps in meeting climate ple pledges. I said this a few days ago, that you know my little daughter cannot graduate from class five to class six unless she passes the final exam of class five. Uh, so I don't understand how we can have climate negotiations talking about the final exams for class seven or class 10 without having passed the climate exam for class five which is your pre-2020 commitments. So, and we see that 80% of the submissions for the global stock take talk about this issue. Equally, we see a lot of focus in these submissions on sustainable lifestyles as well and the role of carbon markets. We see, of course, the call for additional financial flows and, of course, as always, the call for technology partnerships and co collaboration, not just technology transfer, but technology co-development. So, how does this then come together? In order to establish accountability for the past as well as for the future, the G20 link to the COP is about not just the, the uh, enhancing developing country NDCs, but also establishing the equity and historical responsibility. Similarly, on delivering nascent damage the G20 link is, of course, on sustainable finance, but the action we need at COP is that the loss and damage fund be operationalized, but we've also called for a global vulnerability index. How do we decide where the money needs to go unless we have accounted for the vulnerability? And that should be a global south-led research consortium. In order to build adaptation and increase resilience, the G20 re re uh, announced the Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group. But there has to be what is called comprehensive multi-hazard early warning system, something that the UN Secretary General's Climate Ambition Summit in September also called for, a universal multi-hazard early warning system, again, something in which India has taken a lot of leadership and could share its, its knowledge with the rest of the developing world. Scaling the finance, the trillions for the billions that the G20 called for, this requires a common definition of climate finance but also fulfillment of previous targets while reducing the risk perceptions for investment in future. And finally, to secure this energy transition, not just put out big numbers and big targets, but understand the nuts and bolts of how this works, 
We need an architecture that will govern these new fuels of the future. And that, is, that requires multilateral collaboration on education, on training, and on skilling. So really what I have tried to tell you is that when we read these headlines, it is easy to believe that this is all rhetoric. And of course, when we don't fulfill our ambitions, the rhetoric also becomes a source of despondency, despair, and disillusion. But if we actually look at how India's G20 presidency took a very scientific and methodical approach towards one planet, one family, one future, then we see that the clear outcomes that we got from the presidency translates into certain key bricks that we can use to build that bridge between the G20 and COP28. Whether it's on accountability, whether it's on finance, on resilience, on vulnerability, or on securing the fuels of the future. It's these nuts and bolts that will make the bridge stable and reliable. And that is what the Global South is looking for. Not empty promises, but a bridge on which we can all walk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for also reminding about the very logo of G20, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, Earth is but one family. And also uh, very, very nicely articulating that climate change is the epitome of all environmental challenges and that when India speaks it speaks from a position of strength and responsibility and this is based on its resolute domestic and international actions that it has taken. Uh, I am told you have to be leaving for some place so we can have one or two questions from the distinguished delegates in the audience to, uh, because it should not be a one-way traffic, it should be a two-way traffic, and any question, any, any input on G20 to COP28, either as a package or independently, each one of them, anybody would like to take the floor and Say something? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I recognized you first, but you are pointing to him, so yeah. choices between the two of you. Go ahead, please. was uh, very informative and very happy to see the progress towards uh, COP28. I was just wondering is that if there's a focus on health, because I was looking at the UNGA's um, uh, this year, and the focus on health was like much less than what it is uh, expected to be. So since One Health was also an important part of G20, yes. and is also something that WHO has taken up, and I think it's, it's an important step towards uh, uh, addressing climate uh, action and climate mitigation. So is, that, is there a focus on that during this transition from G20 to COP28? We can collect the sure, question. Sure. Sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ananda is my guru in, in transformational change. And of course, climate is the world's guru. Uh, my question I was coming to uh, is, uh, you know, we are trying to discover what is it we must change about the paradigm of our thinking and the paradigm of our finding solutions so we can solve this problem which, as you said, we haven't classed class five and we're already setting goals for class seven and class eight. So what are our learning disabilities which are preventing us even we haven't passed class three yet? We're already talking about goals of class seven. Our learning disabilities, what are they? And I just think that, you know, we have espoused theories but we continue to have actual theories in use. So this theory about GDP, mm -hmm. we are all saying GDP is hardly the correct 
measure is not a complete measure, it's hardly the correct measure. And so why do we need to prove that any action that we are taking to uh, do the right things for lifestyle will actually add up in the GDP? It doesn't matter. Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting the Director General of the RIS. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Bhatt. Very kind. Uh, Arunabha, thanks for this excellent presentation. And you rightly said it's a bridge. I just wanted to brief you uh, last evening with uh, uh, Sherpa, Mr. Mitab Khan, being here with us. Uh, uh, we launched something that we have called as gallery. And I would request my colleagues to give uh, you some details about this idea. And you rightly said we need to bring in uh, new uh, gravitas to this research that is required to articulate be going in the direction of new measurements, new indicators, and bringing in new concept. You rightly said Global South. Mm -hmm. So what we are discussing since morning here is to bring in some of these elements of uh, well-being, as uh, Mr. Arun Mehra rightly mentioned, uh, bring in, connect at the sectoral level, so agriculture, health, what kind of transition you mentioned about railways yeah. you know railway would become net zero so how this transition should happen at the uh, at the sectoral level how that should happen at the uh, macro level but within our research community what areas researchers can choose depending on their specialization how do we collate that energy as of now what has happened is that those uh, in the main field of economics they say that we don't work on climate change mm -hmm. that time luxury we do not have everybody is now uh, heavily into the idea of sustainability be that those who specialize in trade but are now looking into sustainability so my question to you is as you would be representing many of our think tanks uh, and of course CEW uh, at uh, COP you would find some opportunity of connecting the idea of life and how the future research work of different sectoral specialization should converge and take us collectively forward. Thank you. Uh, there is now interest in the audience. So we will take two more questions or uh, maybe three. We freeze there then. Thank you. Um, there are two very difficult issues coming up at COP. One is the idea of net zero from fossil fuel energy, uh, which, which I implicitly includes carbon removal. The other is the loss and damage fund, whether large emitters would be eligible for drawing from that fund. Thank you. So, uh, sir, somebody at the back had asked, and there we froze, but if it is very important, very quickly, but give it to the person at the back. Here, here, here. Sorry, I do not know your name, so. Yeah, Dr. Ghosh, the way India is growing fast economy and very soon we will be a th 3 trillion, 5 trillion economy and the rest of the world is trying to stop this economic growth because of zero debt. So can we bypass this type of, the way Trump is skipping this type of Paris, can we skip also this type of agreement? You made your point very quickly, yes. Over to you, sir. Don't raise your vocal cords, you can Sorry. use. Uh, I am Ajay Mishra from Hyderabad. I am with my interest in renewable energy. Sir, the question. Yes, question, question very brief. Uh, construction industry in its different facets contributes significantly to pollution and is a, one of the big energy guzzlers. How much was it focused during the G20 or See, related uh, discussions and was there any see, decision or uh, agreement on the green buildings which are being promoted but a very limited impact till now. <coughs> That's all. Thank you. Uh, last and Thank you. I am uh, Rajendran Gavinda from South Africa. Um, very interesting this year in the G20 resolution to include African the African Union as a new member. So uh, my question is, how can the international community with a specific focus on the G21 better support and empower African nations 
in their efforts to address climate change and promote sustainable development with this new uh, child on the block. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, sir, you were hesitantly raising your hand, but do you really want to very quickly then make your point? Sir, I'm Kanhya Ujha. Uh, I find little uh, little paradox when it comes to um, uh, uh, climate finance. We have seen that most of the countries in, in G20 uh, forum has agreed to uh, put more, to spend more money on climate change. But on the other side, we find that the emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, uh, in, in these countries has enhanced by 40 percent. This is what last night uh, 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 our Shapra, Mr. Amitabh Kant has declared that. So how would you, don't you find this is paradox? On one side, we're spending the finance. On the other side, the emissions are increasing by 40 percent. I think we had enough questions. And uh, Dr. Ghosh, at any time, feel free to pass on to the distinguished panel, not yes. to the moderator in any case. <laughs> but uh, we have a distinguished panel and they would, un I would request that you answer these questions while you make your presentation, make your point. So that we save on time. Yes. But you are free to let, let, take let, your let, time and short answers. No, no, I'll, I'll try to t uh, uh, answer as quickly as I can. Um, this is not a grade 5 exam you have posed to me. This is uh, f far more. There is a PhD thesis you have outlined through all these questions. Let me start from the last question. We just uh, released from CW three weeks ago a report where we showed that for 2030, the, even if we accept the global average reductions that the IPCC says of 43 percent, the uh, ambitions from the developed world amounts to only 36 percent. But when we calculated their emissions trajectory currently, even by their own admission, they are going to reduce their emissions only by 11 percent by 2030. So this is what we call the big, not emissions gap, an implementation gap amounting to 3.7 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, we have another report coming out tomorrow which is about lifestyles and I'll save that for later. But this then relates back to the second last question that came up about what does this then mean for the other end of the spectrum, the sub-Saharan African countries, for instance, and where does their development uh, prospects lie. So in order to look at these two extremes, I'm going to try and address uh, your questions in, in, in some groups. The first is that we will, and I think Sachin uh, brought this out as well, this whole issue around, uh, because your question was about the construction industry, but it, it's in broadly framed as the sectoral pathways that are needed. Increasingly, that is the discussion we are having. We had it even last year when India gave its updated NDC. Um, I wrote about it in Foreign Affairs as well, that the collaborations between countries, even when they don't agree on all principles, the collaborations are more easily possible on sectoral pathways. Um, whether it's construction, whether it's steel, steel, cement, fertilizer, petrochemicals are three quarters of our industrial emissions. Um, so that's where we have to be focusing on. Um, the other issue around, you know, uh, net zero from fossil fuels and the use of carbon capture storage, as well as, uh, so this, uh, if we look at the, the IPCC uh, results, of course, there, it is not zero, it is net zero, means you're sucking something out of the atmosphere or preventing something from going into the atmosphere. But I think there is a danger of leveraging your strategy based on an assumption that that technology will suddenly become viable in 2035 or 2040. Yes, we have to work on it. India is also working on it. But this is why the near-term targets have to become that much more aggressive, especially from the developed world, rather than just kicking the can down the road. Um, issue of health came up. Uh, yes, One Health was addressed even in the G20, and this year in the COP, I think it is the 3rd of December, which will be the Health Day. So yes, some of these issues will come together, but health is not just the growth of zoonotic diseases, etc., but also heat stress, uh, the impact of air pollution, etc., uh, on our health, and, you know, Dr. Mr. Myra referred to learning disabilities, air pollution has a direct impact on learning disabilities. Um, but the broader point here is 
that we have to think about these sectoral pathways, whether it's health, whether it's agriculture, whether it's cement, whether it's steel, but then look at the intersection. So to Dr. Chaturvedi's question, the broader point I would ask for economists to analyze is do, does a policy have, or what policy has what implication for jobs, for growth, and for sustainability? Um, it's not just picking one or the other. And therefore, I want to now address the broader, more philosophical point uh, that Mr. Myra has brought up. You know, what is our learning disability? I think number one, Mr. Myra, our learning disability is we are a technocentric world and a technocentric economic paradigm, meaning that lifestyles is thought of as, a, as an afterthought, not as central to economic theory, because we assume our gains and our losses, our merits and our demerits can be solved primarily through technology. And this is where why we celebrate, for instance, an electric SUV built by Tesla rather than asking why do you need an electric S why do you need an SUV in the first place. Right? Uh, therefore, I, and I, I talked about this at a, at a UNIDO conference just two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There were five things I was taught as a, when I studied economics, and I think all of those aspects are failing. Number one, I was taught that labor flows from labor-rich regions to labor-poor regions, and capital flows in the other direction. Both of those are failing, because our assumption that labor markets are going to be fun fungible and flexible needs to be seriously questioned, which is why there is pushback from labor, whether it's in the developing world or the developed world, against the transition that does not focus on them. Similarly, capital does not flow from capital rich to capital poor regions. Luca, Robert Lucas, the Nobel laureate, had already pointed it out before the UN Convention, Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. And yet, we kept assuming that as, we, as long as we keep putting out targets, capital will automatically flow. The third thing we were told is that the a, industrial policy is bad. But we are increasingly seeing the industrial policy is back. But it is back in a very different way. When the U.S. spends $369 billion on uh, clean energy subsidies for its economy, it sucks capital out of the developing countries and emerging markets back into their economies. So how do we use industrial policy to build bridges rather than build protectionist barriers? Number four, I was told, as long as the price is right, energy or resources are not a limiting constraint. That is wrong. We do have a finite set of resources, and you cannot just simply say the pricing alone, and which is why the G20 presidency focused on non-pricing measures as well. And finally, we were told that technology, going back to the learning disability, technology or the X factor in our growth equations it emerges exogenously. But technology actually has to be created and it has to be co-developed. And for whom? Are we developing technology to suck carbon out of the atmosphere? Are we developing technology to make it easier for a silk weaver to be able to generate real silk using solar power? You know, the, the, the market is very different. The audience is very different. So unless we start questioning some of these basic assumptions and these basic economic theories we've inherited, we are continuing to make the mistake of putting out targets that are not linked to the nuts and bolts of what makes the real world work. Thank you so much. I, I have virtually uh, no point to add, but to Ms. Myra, your point of learning disability, that's a very interesting one, and I am tempted, and I'll use my position of the moderator to say something. In this inequitable world, <coughs> where there is uh, greed and arrogance of a few, who are having over excessive consumption patterns which are a driving force for the, ent the environmental stress in the world, who are putting the world in a jeopardy. The learning, it is, you used it very mildly, learning disability is total opaqueness. Whereas, you see the, the way 
this country has been functioning or this civilization, this part of the world. The Rig Veda says, Ano Bhadra Kratvo Yantu Vishwataha. In a gathering like this, let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. And that earth is but one family. That's the premise. We don't oppose. We propose. We propose solutions. And uh, on the point of health, I think there is much to be done, but not being done at the either in the CBD and that would or in UNFCCC. Because from India, which has this four codified systems, Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani and Swarikpa, and with such a rich medicinal plant base of more than 6,500 and vast, vast uh, non-codified knowledge. You know, you have so much to offer to the world. But the tiger palm cells, you don't have an equivalent. So there, that's where you are. You know, you need to, everything has to perform. Every individual, every scheme, every body would need to tackle. And uh, of course, the net zero thing was also very tempting. And net zero point that, sir, you made. Uh, researchers have calculated worldwide, not only Indian researchers. And they have said that if 50% chance of limiting the warming to 1.5 degree, US would need to reach net zero by 2025. Time does not permit. I am only telling you the result of the research worldwide. There is a consensus. Germany would have to reach by 2030 and not 2045 as declared. And EU as a block by 2031 instead of 2050. So how fraudulent that net zero target is has been explained by saying when they had to reach much earlier, it is being delayed for a free ride. I think that sums up, we have not left anybody except the question on Africa, Sorry, which while you make the presentation, you handle the, the point. Uh, panelists don't question each other. <laughs> we move ahead. Sorry for that, but we move ahead. We have the uh, presence of Dr. Femida Khatun, who is currently the executive director of the Center for Policy Dialogue a leading think tank in South Asia. Madam, you had indicated your desire to take, up, take on the last point in the agenda that has been distributed. The, the bullet point says, how can the means of implementation for combating climate change be secured as per the extent provisions of various multilateral treaties? So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, I think um, after a, after such a you know such an elaborate discussion, um, and when the discussion went to the philosophical level, I think bringing it back to the basic is quite difficult. But I'll try um, you know to discuss some of the basic points. Um, as uh, our keynote speaker very eloquently you know, discussed various aspects of you know, the GDP you know, measure um, and how the sustainable GDP is measured and how the you know, classical economics um, doesn't really take into account the values, the intrinsic value of the um, nature. And also, he has very eloquently discussed some of the uh, issues which are going to be on the table um, in COP28. Um, he, as he has rightly mentioned that the G20 uh, declaration um, has this Green Development Pact for a Sustainable Future, which talks about uh, many indicators, including the temperature target, the macroeconomic impact of uh, climate change, and also the um, delivering on the sustainable uh, finance, protecting um, and conserving the ecosystem, and also many other issues. 
So I will just f focus on a few issues which are um, related to the COP28 and which emanate from some of the issues which the G20 um, delineates in this pact. First, the issue you know, much discussed about in this issue of finance. You know, as you have mentioned that the means of implementation, and when you talk about means of implementation, finance comes to the fore. And uh, here, I think when you talk about finance, three areas of finance we deal with. One is the you know, climate finance, which is um, articulated in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, which uh, talks about uh, the finance which should be implemented um, on the basis of a principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and, respons uh, and respective capabilities among countries. And this is based on the um, historical fact that historical emitters have a responsibility, that meaning that the developed countries who have been emitting, they have the responsibility. So that is why the common but differentiated responsibility. And this issue is actually at the core of climate governance. Um, in fact, when in, 20, in 2009, the countries, rich countries, agreed to uh, contribute um, 100 billion a year. Uh, that was, you know, that was a promise which has not been met. But also, there are several issues related to that. One is that this is too little compared to the requirement, and the disbursement is too slow, and also the distribution is not fair. So that. Uh, promise has also the other types of you know um, connotations um, because the if you look at the type or the modality of the distribution OECD data says that the developed countries actually mobilized um, up to you know in 2021 data OECD data that 89.6 billion dollar has been um, mobilized for developing countries but around 68% of this was allocated uh, through concessional loans. And the concern here is that this could worsen the debt liability. And when you talk about debt liability, let me give you some uh, information because debt burdens um, in the low and uh, middle income countries has been increasing. And particularly when we are going through an economy the world, particularly since the COVID-19, and then afterwards the Ukraine war, food, fuel, uh, fertilizer crisis, uh, that has led to uh, countries in a situation where many countries are facing instability of their macroeconomic situation. And the debt burdens have increased. Debt as a percentage of countries' gross national income, or GNI, has increased significantly. And during 2010 and 2022, uh, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the Middle Eastern countries, and the North African countries, their debt has, many of their debts have really uh, no, increased. And, um, in many countries, it has doubled. In South Asia itself, it has increased by 2%, which is not a big number. But many countries, for example, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, have been facing the problem. In fact, my own country, Bangladesh, is also having, you know, going to experience um, this uh, you know, debt burden soon, because uh, in the coming years, it has to repay the uh, you know, debt. And, um, as of today, 30 LDCs and low-income countries are in debt risk. And in 2022, 25 developing countries had to spend more than one-fifth of their uh, revenues to service public external debts. So therefore, debt is an issue, and developing countries and LDCs advocate for a higher share of grants rather than concessional loans. The other issue of, on climate finance is that the increasing uh, the amount because rich countries they not only have you know not met the 100 billion dollar but now they also have to increase um, their uh, commitments um, in the in, in the cop 28 and in this regard the commitments of the multilateral uh, development banks that has to be increased 
and there they also have to you know reform which has been uh, emphasized by the G20 presidency time and again and reform in terms of recapitalization uh, of these MDBs and also so that they can provide more support to the uh, developing countries and least developed countries. The second issue, which also has been mentioned by our keynote speaker, is the loss and damage. Again, the historical responsibility. And here, some of the challenges are that. The first challenge is that because the clarification that who is going to qualify qualify for this uh, you know loss and damage fund that there is a lack of clarity there of course this is for developing country but it has to be spelled out more the second one is that the contribution itself the western countries they are asking for other countries to take responsibility for example that you uh, and usa they are advocating for shared responsibilities <coughs> with the non and annex two countries for example saudi arabia and china they should also come forward to take responsibility to contribute to the loss and damage the third one is that um, the management of this loss and damage fund for an interim period, World Bank is going, is going to host this loss and damage fund. But uh, there has not been any decision on the future host. But here are some concerns, again, that because World Bank prefers loans rather than grants, and also the slow mechanism of funding or disbursement of funding during crisis, during climate crisis. And also the other concern is that the World Bank is too dominated by the US. So these are the concerns of the developing countries. <laughs> The fourth issue is that, uh, so that's why because of this concern, actually these uh, developing countries, they want something like uh, you know, the, uh, a facility, UN FCC based facility like the Green Climate Fund. The, uh, the fourth concern about loss and damage is that the text um, uh, lacks clarity because what would be the scale, what would be the source, and what would be the types uh, of this, you know, whether, whether it is grant or uh, loans, these are the issues which has to be resolved. The third issue is again the climate adaptation. While we are talking about finance a lot, but also the technological issues, um, you know, I haven't touched upon, but our keynote speaker has touched upon the technology issue as well. In case of climate adaptation, again, um, the case of adaptation is that, you know, countries which are vulnerable to the impact of climate change, they are not only vulnerable, but they also ha lack adaptive capacity. And because of lack of their adaptive capacity, they also lose on economic and social ground. So adaptation fund mobilization is very, very difficult. Now we have an imbalance. Most of the funds go for a mitigation, not adaptation. And the other part is that the, um, the private sector is not interested for uh, you know, investing in adaptation because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't ha make a business case. Uh, for example, you know, the shelters for cyclone affected people, uh, private sector wouldn't come forward, so the public finance has to come. Uh, rather, the private sector would go for you know, renewable energy or mitigation types of investment. So there should be a balance. That is why the public finance has a role in case of adaptation. Uh, so the um, other issue in the COP28 uh, is that uh, the, um, the adoption of global goal or adaptation, that is, which talks about a framework, a framework on the objectives, on the indicators of monitoring, those uh, are to be also uh, accepted. In fact, a lot you know, depends, um, the success of COP28 on climate adaptation depends on how these issues are dealt. So um, on technology, I haven't dealt with that, but then, you know, for uh, this is another important means of implementation. And unless this is, you know, this is an issue which has not been um, implemented, and this is an issue which is dealt in the other forum, like uh, in the World Trade Organization (WTO), the you know inter uh, the TRIPS Agreement 66.2 that talks about technology transfer to the develop to the least developed countries, which has not been implemented, which has not taken uh, no um, place. So it's. Uh, the voluntary 
you know, uh, technology transfer and also the mandatory technology transfer, those are important if the developing countries and the least developed countries are to take uh, actions, particularly, you know, uh, for mitigation and also to, you know, uh, to reduce fossil fuel based um, uh, based um, energy and so just to conclude that um, as before cop 28 is likely to you know be uh, completed with some mixed outcome we don't you know we have seen the last experiences all the experiences are that you know whatever you expect it doesn't come out so there will be some mixed uh, um, uh, outcome but uh, the global south you know has to see that how the global north um, you know keeps their commitment and then show their credibility. So I, I feel that uh, that these commitments and the steps towards proper climate finance, um, climate finance, loss and damage, and climate adaptation, these are the issues which uh, are important means of implementation in the context of UNFCC um, under Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give her a round of applause. After all, everything hinges on, on the purse, on the money. And it is, you very rightly said that it is not charity or aid, but reminding the brothers and sisters from the developed world of their unkept promises. It was in UNFCCC that the world had agreed, the developed world had agreed that they would provide new and additional resources, climate specific resources in scale, scope, speed and from public sources. Thank you for, for sharing that with us and of course in terms of money or for resolution of any agenda item, you don't get what you deserve at the end in an unequal world, you get what you negotiate. So thank you once again. Thank you very much.